Hi, I'm Deborah Cohn, the Interim Dean of the School of Management at New York Tech and an executive producer of the In Reality podcast. It is a pleasure to be gathered for this special occasion hosted by New York Tech School of Management. Before we delve into the main event, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the journey that brought us here. In 2019, John Rebecca, an alum from New York Tech, approached us with a vision, a vision for a podcast that would ignite conversations, challenge perspectives, and dive into the heart of pressing issues. With enthusiasm and determination, we rallied together to bring this idea to life. From those early discussions emerged a dedicated team committed to realizing John's vision. Over time, our team has evolved, with each member bringing unique talents and perspectives to the table. Currently, we are privileged to work side individuals such as Petra Shandaraga, myself, John Rebecca, and Ellie Schwartz. Additionally, we've received invaluable assistance from Victoria Newberger and Sabrina Polidoro, among many others. To those who have contributed along the way, we extend our heartfelt gratitude. Now, as we stand on the cusp of our 50th episode, with many more to come, I'm filled with a profound sense of pride and gratitude. The podcast has become more than a project. It's a passion, one that we have poured our hearts and souls into. The journey has been nothing short of remarkable. And it's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with the dedicated team. Before we proceed, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to all the guests that have graced our podcast with their insights, expertise, and stories. Whether past or present or future, your contributions have been invaluable in shaping the conversations we've had and the impact we've made. So as we prepare to enjoy this live broadcast, I invite you to join us in celebrating the culmination of our collective efforts. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the driving force behind the podcast, the man whose passion and vision have shaped this podcast from its inception, John Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Cohen for those wonderful remarks, and, and they're so inspiring and uplifting, and I'm so thrilled to be part of a team, and um, part of my vision was what could I possibly do to give back to uh, a university that gave me such a great start? So this was an idea, and, and I'm hope, hopefully you're getting a lot out of it. I'm excited to welcome our audience and these streaming, uh, those of you who are streaming online to our second live event, Unlocking Opportunities for Job Seekers and Employers in the Digital Age. Now in our eighth, eighth season, we've uh, covered a wide range of topics, and our guests come from a totally different backgrounds, uh, including we've got corporate leaders, we had entrepreneurs, we've got subject matter experts, and we've covered subjects like DEI, innovation, decision making, entrepreneurship, artificial intelligence, data analytics, uh, leadership, risk management, and so much more. It's, it's the cornerstone of the School of Management's professional enrichment program and reflects on the university's thought leadership on issues confronting businesses of all sizes. Our podcast, oh, our podcast is available on every major platform, which means there's no excuse anyone should have where you can't find this or haven't done. Listen in. You're going to get a lot out of it. And we appreciate it if you become a follower. And please leave a review. Thanks. We really want your input. The goal of this evening's event is to provide insights for both employers and job seekers uh, to navigate the online recruiting marketplace. We'll discuss the impact of artificial intelligence and other technologies on how companies find job candidates and what candidates can do to discover and land an ideal opportunity. To begin with, we can all come up with ideas and with the pros and cons of any digital marketplace. And the online market for jobs is no exception. Recent articles state that the rise in online recruiting and job postings has democratized opportunity by enabling people to access employment prospects on a global level. It's toppled the control large companies often had on attracting top talent, thus helping small businesses grow and aligning with a remote workforce and the gig economy. 
We've now had unprecedented visibility into employment opportunities, including access to detailed job descriptions, company reviews, and compensation levels. From a rec recruitment perspective, employers cast a wide net, creating a larger applicant pool to choose from. The process seems efficient, especially as artificial intelligence becomes integrated into resume screening, candidate matching, predictive analytics, and even automated interviewing. Technology has undoubtedly streamlined the process for both recruiters and applicants, making the hiring process more efficient and scalable. However, there are concerns regarding the depersonalization of the hiring process, the encroachment of bias into automated applicant screening, and the potential consequences of relying too heavily on AI. For many applicants submitting resumes to online job boards, receiving automated responses or no response at, no response at all can feel like entering a black hole, leading to frustration and discouragement. It has become apparent that many AI-driven systems provide efficiency at the expense of meaningful candidate engagement and feedback. Yes, it can be discouraging, but it highlights the need for job seekers to adapt and use strategic approaches to stand out in the competitive digital marketplace. By leveraging the expertise of our panelists and speakers, we're offering a valuable platform for sharing insights and ideas to help both job seekers and employers navigate the digital job market more effectively. We're honored to have a prestigious group of experts for our event, led by our keynote speaker, Maria Fry. She's founder and CEO of Executive Consultants of New York, the ECNY Foundation, and Career Map Long Island. Maria has decades of experience working with employers and job seekers alike on career development and employee recruiting. Her pioneering LinkedIn and job search bootcamp curriculums are transforming the employment landscape for thousands of people. Maria, Fry, Maria Fry's achievements have not gone, uh, gone unnoticed. With invitations to present her programs nationally, internationally, to municipalities, universities, and governmental agencies. She has numerous prestigious awards and recognitions, including the 2022 and 23 Best of Long Island Awards for Resume Writing Services and Best Business Coaching. Her accolades include receiving the Kennedy Women of Distinction Award and being a Long Island Power Women honoree. Our panelists, starting with uh, Diane Ferrante, Vice President of Human Resources for Oliver Incorporated. Diane has decades of experience in human resource management, having worked for different organizations in various industries, including printing and specialty packaging, technology, international finance, and intellectual property law. In her current role, Diane plays an integral part in unifying the company's six facilities across the United States with nearly 600 employees. And those programs are geared towards cultural assimilation, training and development, benefit design, performance management, and rewards and recognition. She's always focused on the company's employer brand, as it has often been considered best in class in the printing and packaging industry. Diane encourages employee volunteerism and promotes community service initiatives aimed at giving back. This aligns with the company's purpose of making a positive difference in the lives of its employees, customers, and communities. Diane is a graduate of Hofstra University with a degree in mathematics and a minor in management science. Our second panelist is Keith Stewart, the president of SCG Recruiting. As president and founder of SCG, he works with business owners and hiring managers primarily in the accounting and with law firms. Over the past 25 years, Keith has been involved in numerous HR-related services, including staffing, payroll, recruitment advertising, and human resource communications. As a recruiter, Keith focuses on improving the candidates and employers' experience. As a result, he can help employers find new hires who are happier, more engaged, and more invested in their new employer and their new job. Keith graduated from Stony Brook University with a BA in English and is a certified recruiter of the Society for Human Resource Management. But before we get on to our program, just a few logistics for tonight's event. We're recording the event for future release, so please stay in your seats and be as quiet as possible during the presentations and panel discussions. We'll allocate plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. We ask that all in attendance please, please, please complete a post-event survey form 
We provided handouts of those events. It's in your packages that you received when you came in. Or you can scan the QR code provided, which will link you directly to the survey. For those of you attending online, uh, you'll, you'll, have a, you'll receive a survey link, which should be going out shortly. Your feedback will help provide insights into how well we achieved our goals for this event and what we can do better the next time. This information helps us improve our planning and execution of future events, ensuring that we provide the best pop possible experience for our attendees. And then following the event, we urge you to stay, network, and get to know the speakers and your fellow attendees. We'll also have some light refreshments when you leave tonight. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you take away valuable insights and connections. And now I'll turn the program over to our keynote speaker, Maria Fry. Thank you, John. Hello, NYIT, and yes. <laughs> so I'm pretty loud, so if I get a little bit too loud, just let me know, and I will tone it down a little bit. So how many of you here are actually looking for a job right now? OK. That seems to be a nice little number. Well, not that it's nice to be unemployed. But the reason I'm saying that is because you are in the perfect place at the perfect time to learn from the perfect people, which is our wonderful panelists and myself, of course. So I'm really excited to get started and to talk to you guys about things that are going on today. And here we are on the right page. <laughs> OK, guys. So what do you feel is the toughest piece of looking for a job right now for you? Is anyone open to sharing? You can't be silent. OK, yes. Knowing where to look. Absolutely. That is definitely one of the keys right there, knowing where to look. And especially today, with so many different places to look, it can become very, very arduous. It can become very stressful. And I know that John also spoke about a few different things that occur, such as you're not hearing back, and a lot of other things that are happening as well. So as I mentioned, you're definitely in the right place. How did we communicate during COVID? Let's talk about that for a moment, because that has definitely changed the way that we look for jobs today. So how did you guys communicate during COVID? I'm sorry? Yep, radio conference. What else? Social media, absolutely. Email, yes, absolutely. Say that again. Anything digital. So we were FaceTiming. Of course, phone calls were always a good thing. How many of you spent a good amount of time having virtual coffee on like Zoom or Teams or anything like that? Yep. Well, guess what? That is why the world is the way that it is today, because we got so good at doing those things virtually. So that is now a part of what we do and the way that we adopted these processes into our daily work. So that's something that we need to think about also. So now, as you can see here, we have a few different things that are happening. So the current state, so we have technology-driven recruitment. What does that mean? That means that we are relying more on ATS, so applicant tracking systems, and artificial intelligence to find you, to find candidates, to find the people that we need to fill the different positions that we have open. And I know that that can be very stressful. Is there anyone here who is not very comfortable with technology? Let me remind you that we are at NYIT. <laughs> OK, guys. Well, and that's OK, because you know what? Sometimes it's OK to be uncomfortable. I'm more comfortable on Zoom than I am on Teams. So there you go, a little uncomfort there sometimes. But as we proceed and as we continue to interview, I think what's important is that we start to become more comfortable. And the way we become more comfortable is to do. OK, so that is something that's happening. Remote work environments and opportunities are definitely on the rise. And that is because people became very comfortable working from home. And also, a lot of companies found out that they can actually get the work done that way and that they were successful getting the work done that way. 
At the beginning, it was very scary because a lot of people did not feel that it was going to be successful, but here we are, we're still doing it. And so that's becoming a larger part of the workforce. So remote work opportunities, I don't think for the foreseeable future that is gonna go away anytime soon. And so get comfortable with technology and get comfortable working from home if you want to. Of course, a lot of companies are now also opening up and they're like, well, we're giving you the option. Okay, so that's a good thing as well. Another thing is skill-based hiring. One thing that I noticed significantly, I think this was from like the very, the beginning of when things started opening up, was that companies were hiring based on skill set more so than do they have the particular education that we need. Have they been, de been there, done that, and can they bring that skill set to us as an organization? Why is that important? Why does skill set sometimes trump, and I'm not saying anything bad about education, okay? But why does skill set and experience sometimes trump education? Who could take a wild guess? Yes, adaptability, absolutely. So that is one of the reasons. It's actually one of the primary reasons. So that's something we also have to take into consideration when we are looking for various opportunities. Do we have the skill set for it? One of the tips that I give my clients when I work with them is I will always say to them, if you look at a job description or a job spec as we call it, and you see that you have 50% of the qualifications apply to it, take a chance because sometimes it's more about what you have than what you don't have. So what I just did for you, by the way, for those of you looking for jobs, is I just opened up a pool just a little bit, okay? So continue to look for opportunities, and if you see that your skill sets do absolutely cover at least 40 or 50%, go for it. What is the worst thing that can happen? I believe that for every no, you're that much closer to your yes. So what our job is to continue to put ourselves out there and see what happens and have, an, have as many conversations as you can. That's something I actually want to talk about really quickly. I want you to stop thinking about the word interview, and I want you to think of the word conversation. And the reason for that is the minute someone says, I have an interview. How did I just sound? Petrified. <laughs> okay, don't be petrified. It is a conversation. It is a two-way street. You need a job, but companies also need people to run the company, correct? So that's something I want you to focus on. Focus on having as many conversations as you possibly can. That will lead you to opportunity. The other thing also here is gig economy growth. What is that? So basically, a lot of people have gone out on their own. They've become contractors. They're very happy doing that. Are th there's good and bad to both. Um, there's a lot of differences in both as well, but I think that if, in fact, you are open to project management, consulting, things like that, this is the time to get into it. It was funny, when I started ECMY Corp, it was in 2009, and so what was happening in 2009? Basically, the economy was a mess, and I was leaving a corporate job to start ECNY, and I really didn't have a very clear idea of what I wanted to do, and everybody kept saying, are you crazy? Seriously, you're gonna go, you're gonna leave a corporate job where you have all these perks, and you're gonna start a company in the worst economic crisis we've ever known? And all I remember from that conversation was what I said to them, which was, you know, I read somewhere that more millionaires and billionaires are made during an economic crisis than during any other time in history because they identify a void and they fill it. Why am I sharing this with you? Because every single person in this room that is looking for a J-O-B, a job, a career, whatever it is, is a person that's going to fill a void within a company. So don't give up, keep having those conversations because there's a lot out there. But the gig economy is definitely something to think about. If you're good at building websites, if you're good at creating podcasts, if you're good at all of these amazing technological wonder, wonderful things, then go for it. Check out what's going on locally. Maybe ask a neighbor, ask someone that you know that has a business and ask them, do you need help? How can I get more experience? And so the gig economy 
started with that. It started with people basically trying to do little projects here and there, and then it turned into a business. Is there anyone here that consults? Okay. Is there anyone here that can consult? Every single person better put their hand up right now. Hands up, let's go. There we go. Okay. So that is the truth. The truth is that anyone that has a skill set can consult. If you have a skill set within a specific area, a specific niche, you can consult. It could be a small job here and there until it turns into a bigger job like ECNY, but I will tell you right now, it's definitely something worth looking into. The other thing is hybrid work models. So this is talking more about, it could be part-time and, or it could be part at work, part at home. It could be days where basically you make up your own schedule. It could be completely remote. So there has been a lot of hybrid work environments out there. Um, the other day, as a matter of fact, I had someone who told me that originally when they went on the interview, the person told them, you need to be in the office five days a week. They did not want to go into the office five days a week. And I said, I was like, well, if you want the job, then you, know, you, you kind of have to figure that out. I said, you know, did you ask him if there was any flexibility? He's like, no. And I was like, OK, why not? And he said to me, well, because you know, I need the job. And I said to him, I was like, there's nothing wrong with asking the question, especially today where we are more comfortable utilizing Zoom and Teams and all these wonderful things. So never be afraid during an interview to ask that question also. What's the worst thing they can say? No, that is the worst thing that they can say. All right. So job seeker concerns are valid. It was funny, while I was doing some due diligence on this topic, which is something I deal with every single day, I actually found someone on LinkedIn who I thought was in New York, and I was actually speaking with her to see if she wanted to be a panelist. And she said to me, she's like, I'd love to, but she's like, I'm in Dubai right now. And I said to myself, I was like, it says New York on your LinkedIn profile. I mean, what's going on here? She's like, I got a six month contract. And I said, good for you. I was like, that's tremendous. Well, she shared some amazing information with me. And one of those little bits of information was from the Pew Research Center, 62% of job seekers believe that artificial intelligence will have a major impact 62%, that's pretty tremendous, right? When you think about it, 62% of people. At the same time, I think that the concerns are completely valid, but I think that we can't allow it to stop us, right? So some of the concerns are fairness, okay? Um, I think one of the concerns for me when it comes to fairness is, is the person that I am speaking with, or if it's AI, is it understanding what it is that I bring to the table? Is it truly giving me a fair chance to expound upon what it is that I bring to the table? I can't answer that because I'm not an AI bot. <laughs> and AI is only as smart as we do what? We program it to be, exactly. So that's something that we need to think about. The other thing is transparency. I love, as a matter of fact, we were talking about this earlier on, when I run uh, my bootcamp programs, I usually have close to 50 people in the class, and I don't allow them to take any like bot notes, as I call them. So they'll use Copilot, they'll use Firefly, they'll use all these different things to take notes, and I kick them right out of the Zoom session. Nope, sorry. Not only that, I wanna see your face. What is it about seeing someone's face that brings transparency? Excuse me? Yes, it builds trust. I like that very much. Yes, absolutely. The other thing is when I'm looking at someone, I can see if there's still a question mark in their mind. If I see them and they're making a face like this, then I'm going to expound on what it is that I'm trying to say. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a blank screen or just kind of like an AI type interview, you don't have that opportunity. I actually had someone that interviewed with a company, um, I think it was three weeks ago now, and it was a purple screen. They didn't tell her it was gonna be an AI interview. So she logs on to what she thinks is going to be like a Teams interview, and it was a purple screen, and it had these upside down quotation marks as eyes, and they blinked. Great, fantastic. I'm sure that was very important. And then it had a mouth that zigzagged when it spoke. And she freaked out completely. 
And so what she did was she went through with it. She answered all the questions. And then she got off. She called me up. She said, I'm done. She's like, I don't want to be a part of this company. I can't do it. And I said to her, I was like, just give them a chance to get back to you. What she received back was an automated response to her interview. How do you feel about that? She wasn't happy. You see, here's my problem with that. My problem with that is that I want to know that if I'm going to work with an organization and they use AI so much so that not even one of the interviews thus far or not even one of the points of communication was with a human being, that if, God forbid, I'm working for them and now we're at DEF CON 1 and I need information that you're not going to say to me as my supervisor, go to the computer and pull out module four, you should get your answer. How's that going to help me in the middle of a crisis? What is that going to do? So anyway, this individual decided not to proceed with that company. She said to them, thank you very much, because they did ask her for a follow-up, and she just said, no, I don't want to work with them, and that was just, that was her decision. So that is something that's important. That's also part of the human interaction. So efficiency, that's a given right there. Is it effective? Are they being effective? And I have to be completely honest again. I personally am not a fan of a lot of the AI, you know, type interview bots that are blinking at me and squiggling their mouths at me. I, I don't know how I feel about that. I think I'm a little nervous about it, actually, because, you know, what they are doing is they are telling you at the beginning in many cases that they're not just recording you. They are also recording the picture of you. So what do you think your face looks like when you're looking at this beautiful robot? Just a little like, what is going on here? Yeah. So you're not putting your best foot forward, or they're not allowing you to put, to put your best foot forward. That's a concern. And obviously, job fit. I cannot tell you how many times, John and I actually spoke about this a little while ago, where we were talking about the constant change of titles within the various companies that a person goes to from one career or from one company to the next. And what was really interesting was many years ago, I placed an executive director in a VP position. And what had happened was originally when we submitted him for consideration, they said, no way, he's not a VP. And I said, hold on a second here. You need to look at this person's resume. And they said to me, they're like, why? And I said, well, this, this executive director has worked for a multi-billion dollar company. Two of them, as a matter of fact. One of them is your key competitor. And no, they don't have a non-compete. <laughs> I said, you don't have to worry about that. And I said, your company hasn't even cleared 400 million. And what do you think happened? They took a look at the resume. And what did happen was he was hired for a six month contract and then it was extended. And then he got hired full time for the VP position. So my concern is job fit, title fit, keywords, are they the same across the board? What is the answer to that? Absolutely not. They're not the same across the board. So we need to be very, very careful about fit, okay? And what fit means is understanding what you're going to be doing every single day. How can we identify that? Well, honestly, if you are not going to get a human being where you can ask questions, the best thing for you to do is take a look online. Take a look on LinkedIn, look at people's profiles that do a similar job or the same job, and look and see what it is exactly that they're doing. If they're using particular skills or they're using particular words for those skills, the best thing that you can do is make sure that you are putting those skills in your resume, in your LinkedIn profile, so it'll get picked up by the ATS systems and also the any kind of AI that they're using. All right. So the future state of finding employment, AI and automation is not going away, not anytime soon. So if that's not going to change and it's going to become more and more the norm, then what we need to do is we need to change the way that we're looking for opportunities. And again, that could be the way that we are creating our resumes. And I will just say one more thing about, um, actually I'll say a lot of things about resumes as we're going through this, but one of the things I will say, it's very interesting because AI is supposed to be so smart, yet did you know that if you submit a resume that has a line straight down the middle, it'll actually kick you out. Yep, a lot of ATS systems will kick you right out and so will the AI systems. And that's because we did not train them to pick up on this. 
And it was funny because I was on a radio show talking about this stuff a couple of weeks ago. And I, I think it was actually last week. I couldn't believe it. I was like, a line? Seriously? Just a line. That's it. But how are you, or how much are you willing to allow something like that to take this opportunity away from you? So this is knowledge that we really need to understand. We need to understand the systems that we are applying to and basically what we could do to position ourselves in the best way possible so that we are picked up. Um, remote first culture, again, that's not going away. We talked about um, people working remote and how successful that has been for a lot of companies. And I think that has also become something that people are very excited about also. I actually have quite a few clients that I'm working with right now and they all say, no, it has to be remote. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, well, you know, I really enjoy what I'm doing right now. I enjoy working from home. I enjoy being able to, you know, just kind of get up in the morning and do my job. And you know something? Some people are more effective working from home. Some people are absolutely more effective working from home. And if, in fact, you're also a commuter, well, you know what? You're shaving off that time, so what can you do with that time? Continue to work for the company, absolutely. So I guess if you kind of sell it like that to the organization, they might think twice. <laughs> the other thing also here is upskilling and reskilling. I love this. Um, I actually work with Stony Brook's Corporate Center for Education, and that is all that we do there. Basically, they're all programs, and I know that they have programs here also at NYIT, uh, pro uh, project management, marketing, digital marketing, so there's a lot of different things going on, and I think that that is something that we cannot stop learning about. We need to continue to hone our skill sets. Project management, for example, is one of the hottest, hottest commodities out there. If you have project management skills, you are golden in many companies. So that is something that you definitely should take a look at. But it's not just about that, it's, it's about continuing to learn in whatever industry you choose to work in. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know what, diversity is key. Diversity in the way that we think, diversity in the way that we work together, diversity in the backgrounds of the individuals within a company. I think the best companies that I ever worked for, my background is originally in corporate operations, and I worked from, my goodness, I worked with people from all over the world, and it was the most amazing thing, because I would say something and they would see it in a completely different way. Why is that beneficial? It gives perspective. You're going to get like massive gold stars like thrown right at you. <laughs> Absolutely. So it gives perspective. It makes you think a little outside the box. It makes you think differently about what the opportunity is. It makes you think different about what you're doing, what you need to do to get it done. That's the other thing also, what you need to do to get it done. Diversity is definitely key. You know, one of the things I love about um, having a foundation is our board. And our board members come from like all over the place. Their backgrounds are all very, very diverse. So when we have a conversation, I love the fact that they're like, yeah, well, what about this? Or if we do it this way, then this is gonna happen. Yeah, it's a good idea, but all these conversations are gold. This is what we need to look for. We need to look for as much diversity as we can. And so it's the same thing when companies are hiring. Having access to the amount of individuals that we have access to today because of how we recruit is definitely a massive plus in my eyes. It also does something which we don't want, which is it gives us more competition because especially if it's a remote opportunity, the person could be half across the country or maybe another country. So that is something that we have to think about as well. And flexible working arrangements. You know, if you don't ask when you're on an interview and they say to you, it's going to be full time, you have to be in the office, as I mentioned before, if you don't ask, you will never know what the answer is going to be. You will never know if they say, you know what, Maria, I could do that. I could do that for you. I'm open to doing that for you. And you know what? Had we not gone through something like COVID, I don't think that we would be as open-minded about this. But I do believe that flexible work environments are definitely going to continue and that's because people are kind of, they're not budging. That's the other thing too. I actually spoke with someone the other day, like, no, I'm okay, I'll pass. And I was like, what do you mean you'll pass? You need a J-O-B. And they said to me, they're like, well, you know what? I'll pass because I really enjoy my time at home. 
I don't have to worry about traffic. I don't have to worry about schlepping here and there or taking the train. And that's absolutely OK. All right. So how has technology altered the landscape? So key factors we should know. Digital literacy and tech skills are not going away anytime soon. Anything tech, anything digital that you can learn, any classes you could take. I mean, we're at NYIT, for goodness sake, so I'm sure there's plenty. But marketing skills, for example, digital marketing, tremendous. Any type of digital skill that you can upskill, learn more about, become more proficient in is the key. And it's going to continue to be the key. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is your personal brand and your online presence. Wow, just the other day, I had to go through 46 LinkedIn profiles. And it was pretty bad. <laughs> it was pretty bad because many of them were skeleton profiles. They didn't show me one little piece about the person's personality and how they were different and the way that they thought and what they liked and how they commented and what they knew about their industry and how they kept their finger on the pulse of their industry. What I'm really talking about is uh, LinkedIn for the most part. And I will say this to you, if you're on LinkedIn, but you're really not doing anything with it, get on that right now. Right now, people, seriously. The other thing is, make sure that your profile presents you in the best way possible. What are you following? What groups are you a member of? What are you commenting on? How are you describing yourself? All this stuff, anything social, any social media out there is a representation of you and a reason why people should want or not want to play a part in your success. So branding is number one, number one, absolutely. Your resume, your elevator pitch, LinkedIn profile, the way you answer questions, the way you speak about your experience, all of these things are critical. That is your brand. So we definitely wanna make sure that all of these things are in top shape. If you're not comfortable with it, Believe you me, you could go on, uh, let's say, YouTube, <laughs> and you could YouTube various things. There's so many more settings than there ever were before on things like LinkedIn especially, and things that, let's just put it this way, you can rub virtual shoulders with people that you normally would never in a million years have access to on LinkedIn, like I did with my new friend Angelica in Dubai. And now we're, we're talking about working together. So what does that mean? Opportunity. So opportunity is always knocking. The question is, are you answering the door? Adaptability and lifelong learning. We mentioned this a little bit before, but I think it's important to go into this once more. At the end of the day, if you do not continue to change with the times and upskill and continue to hone your skills and learn how things are different, as a matter of fact, I consider myself a LinkedIn expert. I've been teaching LinkedIn, I'm on beta for LinkedIn, I've been doing so many things with LinkedIn for many years. I'm in the top 1% worldwide, not to brag. But the funniest thing of all was I went on to LinkedIn the other night while I was teaching one of my classes and everything changed. Everything changed in the groups. And I was so frustrated because I was like, as a beta, I should know this. I should have been privy to this information and I went nuts. And I said to myself, I was like, wow, I need to get on this more now that they're making these changes, I need to continue to learn and continue to, not like I wasn't doing that before, but now more than ever, there are so many changes. And I think that's part of the new world that we're kind of living in, this new digital world. And um, of course, they want to make money too. So that's the reason why they're changing some of their, uh, their settings as well. OK, so the importance of networking and referrals. Ah, I want to talk to you guys about this for a moment. So once again on LinkedIn, there was a gentleman that was, we just talked about it at our table there. Oh my goodness. This man was saying something very derogatory about networking. Don't you ever say anything derogatory about networking around me? Never. This guy said that networking was not the key. He said it's boring. He said that it wasn't effective. And all I kept thinking to myself was, oh my goodness, my KPIs, my metrics tell me otherwise. I. My background was in corporate operations. KPIs, metrics, or key performance indicators, are everything to me. I measure everything. And if I had to, if I had to guess a number of how many of my students or my clients get jobs because of networking, it would be well over 50%. 
Why do you think that is? What is it about networking? Networking is never going to go away. Networking has been a critical piece to a lot of people's success for many, many years. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. Because what is it about networking that makes it easier to find opportunity? Say that again. Yes, the interaction. So imagine, so you're applying online. You're sending your resume through an ATS system. Most companies do have a policy and procedure. Whether you know someone within the company or not, doesn't matter. You still have to apply via the ATS system. It protects the company. It protects you. Totally fine. Not a problem. But here's the problem. The problem is, if you're depending solely on that, some companies don't even send you an email that says, we received your resume. If we like you, we'll call you. Now leave us alone. At least give me that. But we don't even get that. So why is it important to network? Because it's so important to have someone on the inside. Because then when you reach out to that individual or you network with that individual, you can say, you know something? As per your request, I sent my resume through the ATS system. I hope that you received it. I thank you so much for anything you could do. Kind regards, Maria. That's it. You don't need to write a whole dissertation or anything like that. It's a tiny little blurb. But when you have someone on the inside, it changes everything. A fun fact, um, ECMY will be in business 15 years in June. We have never, ever advertised once in 15 years. Every single contract, every single client has been through word of mouth or networking. How about that? It's pretty cool, right? I'm definitely proud of that. So the importance of networking, building meaningful and diverse connections. You know, it's so amazing because when you start speaking with individuals outside of your niche, everything changes. All of a sudden, you find commonalities. And when you find commonalities, what does that mean? You just opened up another pathway for yourself. So networking is still networking. It still works very, very well. And it can also bring a lot of opportunity to you. But what's important about, I say here, building meaningful and diverse. I could just say building diverse connections. I believe in cultivating relationships, not just meeting people, touch and go, and that's it. I want to get to know the person. I want to understand a little bit about them. I want to be able to understand what it is that they do. And so I think that's super important. The other thing is also that if you're reaching out to someone and you're just asking for a job, what is most likely going to happen? They don't know you. So what's going to happen? Chances are, you know, nothing will happen, unfortunately. But cultivating a relationship where you're reaching out, you're saying, you know, I saw this article that you wrote, very similar to my new friend, Angelica. And I actually said to her, I was like, wow, this article that you wrote about AI was absolutely amazing. I loved it. I loved it. I want to hear more. Would you be open to a quick Zoom call? And the next thing you know, two days later, we're on a Zoom call. They're at eight hours ahead. So that was uh, very interesting trying to coordinate that. But it was fantastic. The information that she gave me and also the insight, not just in the US, but across the globe, was I, there was nowhere else I was going to get that information. It was amazing. The other thing here I have is um, accessing hidden opportunities. We talked about that before. But here's another fun fact. Over 80% of jobs are never formally posted. What does that mean? They're not posted on any social media. They're not posted on Monster, Career Builder, Indeed, LinkedIn, all these places, which means that all the people that are applying out there are applying to 20% of the jobs available. What does that mean? Competition. Absolute competition. 80%. It's so funny because I look at that number every single year. It comes up around 80%, and I'm like, what is going on? And you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes it's because the company wants to hire from within the network. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever worked for an organization where perhaps they gave an incentive if you brought someone in. You know, technically, that's a great thing to have because number one, who doesn't want an incentive bonus? Number two, who doesn't want an opportunity where they're brought in and put at the top of the stack of resumes? So that's something that we need to think about as well. So that's the hidden opportunities and the hidden job market, as we call it. Um, demonstrating your value, we talked about this before, optimizing your resume, your LinkedIn profile, any representation of you, whether it be any social media or any other avenue. 
you want to make sure it is as good as it's going to get, as good as it can be. You're optimizing by using the right words and basically you're staying on top of it also. That's another thing. I've seen some, um, <laughs> recently I actually received a resume from someone and it looked like it came from 1982. It was really bad. And I said to myself, I was like, what happened here? What is going on? And so I reached out to the individual because I saw what they had done, the companies they had worked with, and they were actually a great candidate, but that resume did not reflect that. So we wanna make sure that we're demonstrating our value. Um, gaining insights and advice, of course, networking will allow you to do that, and fostering long-term relationships. Here's the thing about networking. I want you to think of it not just for today, but for the future. We don't know what's gonna happen. You can find your A to B job or your C job, which is your career job, or your D job, which is your dream job. You can find that today. And knock on wood, but six months later, they could be acquired by the, another organization. And then what happens? You're looking for a job again. So it's important to continue to network because it's not just for today, but it's for the future. So tactics that companies are using to identify top candidates, leveraging technology, uh, rigorous interviewing processes. Oh my goodness, they are elongating some of these processes. Some companies are really very interesting with their interviewing tactics. Um, I, the last few individuals that I spoke with about the interview process that was just getting to be like out of control, it was way past six weeks. That's a problem. And so here's what I'm going to say to you about that. Regardless of if they say to you that they're, going to make you an, that they're going to make you an offer, I think that the best thing that you can do is keep moving. And if you were to speak to me and say, oh, Maria, I'm so excited. I spoke with them. They said that they're going to make me an offer or that they're making a decision this week, but that they think that my candidacy is favorable. The first thing out of my mouth is going to be congratulations. That's awesome to hear. What else do you have going on? And the reason is because we never know what's gonna happen. And in many, many cases, nothing happens. And then what happens when you let your connections go cold or your opportunities go cold? It is very, very difficult to warm them up again. And you know, the other thing also is that people don't appreciate being made to feel like you used them. You used them when you needed them. Then the job opportunity came about or the offer that you thought came about. And now all of a sudden, it's not there anymore. Now you're trying to, you know, warm that relationship up. People don't, they don't appreciate that. I know I don't appreciate that, but I'm also here to help. So that's a little different. Um, requests for projects. Oh, this is a big one. So more than ever, companies are asking for projects. And that's something that we really need to be careful of. And what I mean by that is how much information should you share? If they're asking you to put a project together that's like a week long you know, work assignment, then you need to ask them how much they're paying you because that is something critical. That's a lot of information that you're giving to them. Now, imagine this scenario. You have five people that were all asked to do projects. They're all asked to put together a mini marketing campaign. Just put a deck together, just like 30 slides. 30 slides? Are you kidding me? This is 10 slides here. And I thought about it long and hard, okay? And then what happens? They interview you and the other people, and now they have five decks, five different ways that they can proceed with their business. Where is the motivation to hire you? Maybe next year, who said that? If I had a Hershey's kiss, I'd throw it at you. There we go, okay. So that's something that we need to be very careful of. Project requests, you know what? If you have a portfolio where you can share something that you've already created, obviously, because proprietary, you want to be careful. Yes. And, but that is something that we need to also think about. How long of a project should it be? A few slides, two or three, I think that's enough. Um, the other thing is utilizing assessments. So <laughs> these are those wonderful questions that we get where they have you just check off the boxes. Do you have these skills? What would you do in this scenario? Those are terrible. They're absolutely terrible. They drive me crazy because I always have more questions. And so that's something that we see a lot of. An emphasis on employee referrals. We talked about that and um, talent pipelines. So what does it take to land a job? Well, these are the five things that I think of the most. 
Resilience, adaptability, creativity, focus, and persistence. At the end of the day, I know it's not an easy ride, but what I want you to do is I want you to repeat after me. Activity, activity. breeds opportunity. Breeds opportunity. Activity breeds opportunity. I trademarked that, I don't know, about seven years ago, so don't take it. But the reason I'm sharing that is because activity does breed opportunity, and there's a lot of opportunity in this room also, so I wish everybody all the very best of networking and for their futures. And now I'd like to invite up our wonderful panelists, Diane and Keith. So to, to kick things off, uh, I'll pose a question to our panelists. Um, for someone looking for their first job or progressing through their career, what are you looking for in a resume that will make someone stand out from the competition? Diane? Yeah. So I would say uh, professional creativity, so some sort of creativity on their resume. I would, I would also say know your resume, right? So know your skills, talk about your skills, your, talk about the software you know, and, and also in that process, know the company that you're looking at. So do research while you're looking. Those would be some of the things I would think you should really hone in on. Um, I agree <clears throat> with those statements as well. I would say also, I want to see that you are truly invested in this particular opportunity that you've submitted a resume to. Um, resumes tend to be templates. Everybody kind of puts one together and then fires that out to every different type of job they apply for. Each job is a little different. You should take that difference and integrate it into your resume somehow. Whether it's a sales role and you're talking about metrics if it's an operational role and you're talking about systems that you've implemented that have saved money or increased sales or whatever it may be, you want to just find that something unique that's going to make your resume stand out. Very good. Um, before, I'm going to ask um, Maria to ask the next question, but I, a follow-up to that. So you've gotten someone's resume um, and you, let's say, put something out there that says, hey, you know, maybe we could set up an interview. And they send a letter back. And Diane, I'm putting you on the spot because uh, Diane was the victim of an AI-generated <laughs> response from an applicant who, uh, who was obvious. It was, it, was obvious. It, it was obvious, but please tell us the story. So I interviewed someone for a managerial role. So it wasn't, you know, a, a, it was a nice, a nice position. And I spent, it was a Zoom interview. I spent, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour with her. So I really, you get to know someone in that time frame. And the next day, I got a thank you, which you always want, so always do the thank you. I got a thank you, and I read it. And as I'm reading it, I, I said, she didn't write this. This is AI, it was an AI-generated thank you. So the next day, I went on to chat GPT, and I typed it in to see if I could recreate this thank you. And I, it was almost verbatim. So please don't do that. <laughs> that would be my advice to everybody. You can use AI to get something you know, that gives you some structure. But related back to the conversation we had, certainly, right? Yeah, exactly. Make it personal, right? Some of the things we talked about. So uh, use it, but use it wisely. It's my suggestion. That Very was, good. She didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> I agree 100%. It's actually really interesting because I've seen a lot of, oops, sorry guys. I'm pretty loud to begin with, so I always forget I have this thing. Um, I've seen GPT resumes and co-pilot resumes, and I'm looking at them, and you know what's funny is that they use a lot of the same words over and over and over, landscape, and uh, you know, navigating, and like all these, and I'm like, what in the world are they talking about? I mean, that's not, that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is 
for you to expound upon what it is that you've done. I think that bullets on a resume should expound. They should tell a story. What you've done, what the success has been, how you achieved it. We like, I like to use a star technique, situation, task, action, result. What was the situation, the task at hand, the action you took, and lastly, how great the result was. Why? It shows me that you've been there, done that, truly understand it, and that's a skill set you're bringing to me. So. And, and I would think, you know, Keith, one of the things that, and, and Diane mentioned it, you know, bring things back to whether it was the conversation, the interview, but also um, whatever you put on that resume, you better be able to back it up. And I, I, I can't, you, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what, the importance of if you say you did something, be prepared to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> on your resume, if you're going to list a um, qualification, an accomplishment, you want to put a little fact in there as well, whether it's a percentage, a dollar amount. Um, it's very easy to say, I, um, I reduced you know, headcount by X people. But what did you do? Or I increased sales by X percent. By doing what? We want to know that you're going to come in and that you're going to deliver a skill that is missing right now. That, that's the reason why that the company's hiring. It's not just to fill a seat. It's to fill a seat with somebody specific enough and, and professional enough and experienced enough to get that job done. You know, you know uh, a lot of companies talk about, um, and it's the, the term that's been coined is the employer brand. So if you're an employer listening in or you're here tonight, the importance of, of, of getting a statement out there, a value proposition for, uh, for applicants. Can you describe your company's employer brand? So I think with employer brand, it's usually... On, on someone's website. So our brand is really all about our culture. And a lot of employers are about their culture. So if it's important for us, you should know it coming in. So look that up, look up our website, see what our values are. If, if I'm saying we value passion, respect, customers, know that coming in, know that, because that's very important to us. That separates us as an employer of choice in the industry. So. If you're coming in and I can see that you've looked that up and you can talk to it, it, it really says to me, oh, this person's here, they're here to do business. So employer brand is important, so know that. No, we, we take it seriously, so you take it seriously as an applicant, for sure. Keith? Yeah, um, I think that's spot on um, when I've got candidates that I set up for interviews. I tell them, and I, I provide the link. I'll say, here's what the company's website is. Here's what they do. Read about their service or read about their product because they are going to ask you. And you, you, you really don't want to get caught with the, I didn't really look at the website or I really don't know what you do. It's the, it's the first and the easiest way to you know, have that, res that interview end. Um, you do want to be aware of what they do. You want to be aware of the industry that you're trying to enter. Um, maybe even the uh, employer who's hiring you, who their competitors are. You just you want to be educated. You want to be able to answer what I would consider basic questions. You know, what do we do that impresses you the most? If you can't answer that, I, I'm probably passing. Got it. Maria, your thoughts? I agree 100%. Oops, there we go again. I agree 100%. Um, you know, I, I'm all about the, I said before, the KPIs, the metrics. I want to know how you've made an impact, how that impacted the organization, how you did it. Walk me through. I need to know that you've been there. Before I would ever present a candidate when I used to recruit, I would always make sure that I would interview them. And if they can get through my interrogation, then I would get them, I would push them through to the next level. But honestly, you know, a lot of people will say things on their resume I've done this, I've done that, but you know what? Back it up because you know something, if you get someone like any of these people on the panel here as your interviewer, we're gonna ask you, how did you achieve this? What was the overall effect on the organization? So it's truly important. Yeah. How has, and, and Maria, I'm gonna start with you on this. How has AI changed the role of the recruiter? Wow, you know, it's funny because so many of the candidates, the students that I have in my class right now are telling me these horror stories about how their first line of communication 
was not with a recruiter, it was via like a text message or an email that said, okay, be on this thing at this time and that's it. So you're excited. You think that you're going to get on to a call with a human being and then all of a sudden it's an AI generated, you know, blinky bot as I was talking about before or it's something where they're just asking questions and they're giving you like five or six options, pick one and then we'll see, you know, what happens. But you can ask questions, you can't do anything. It's very... It's impersonal, and so it is taking over. I think that companies feel that it's expediting the process. It's not. It's elongating the process, hands down. Keith, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I think that's completely true. I think a lot of these companies are trying to um, jump on the bandwagon of new technology, which isn't a bad thing um, if it's proven. I, I think AI, it has its positives. Um, in the interview process, I don't think it belongs there. I think there still needs to be that face-to-face, -face, that um, individual that can interpret emotional response as well as just dialogue. Um, I think it, it requires um, somebody that can answer questions. On the employer side, a little bit different. If you're an organization that receives tens to hundreds of resumes a day, um, an ATS system that incorporates AI that then knows how to parse out and read that resume is, is a game changer for them. It's going to save some time. But again, that ATS, and, and as Maria said earlier, the AI is only as good as its program. It needs to be set up properly so that it knows that it's not kicking out qualified people. Because, I, I mean, I've heard stories where... Um, employers will meet someone and say, wow, you know, we're looking for someone just like you. And the person says, I applied to your company and I never got an interview. And then it turns out that there was something in the resume that kicked them out and it's a sad story. You know, maybe that person got employed somewhere else, maybe even their competitor, but these things do happen. So it's important that the technology is correct and honestly that there's face time with right. candidates. Diane, you're on the employer side. Right. You're on the hiring side. Right. What do you think about right. how that so changed? I, I was thinking a lot of, of what uh, Keith said there. So we use, have an ATS system, and we could use it to screen you know, the catchwords, the catchphrases. Um, our industry, we're manufacturing, so it's a little bit more, um, we, we look for unicorns, uh, I like to call them. Some of our positions are very unique, so we do a lot more screening ourselves. But if you are getting, say, look, say we have a position that's not so technical, uh, the, the system might actually, you know, the algorithm might bounce you out. If you're not using the exact same Phrase it. So if we're looking for, I'll say, mechanical technician, but you have a maintenance mechanic on your resume, I want to see you because I bet you your skills are the skills I'm looking for. But the, but the way sometimes it's set up is it'll bounce you out. So you need to make sure that what's in your resume matches what's in the job description to make sure your resume gets through and gets past the the, the uh, scans from from your your AI, the, the, your ATS. And there are, um, I, you know, just a quick look out there. There's a, a program that's called Job Scan, um, where it will go through and you put in the jobs that you're looking for, and it will compare your resume to all the job postings out there. I've got people shaking their head. Yes, yes, we're doing that, and that's that's really important to remember that it's those keyword choices, right? Um, as it relates to um, new employee, before you make a hire, Diane, are, are you using any tools like um, uh, cultural fit or, or, or organizational fitness mm -hmm. type of tools? So we do, we have a uh, culture index. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's a very quick, um, uh, I don't want to call it a test because it's not a test, but you're answering adjectives. You know, you're selecting adjectives that match who you are, right? And then it puts it in and it, it kind of maps you based on four areas. Your autonomy, your, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, uh, your ability to multitask or, or, you know, are you a multitasker or are you methodical in your approach and your level of attention to detail, right? So, it, and then it maps you and then there's, you know, all different characteristics that it tells you. And you can use that 
to map to a job description. So if I have a very technical um, role, I'm going to look for what they call a craftsman because it has skills that will match this role. So we use that. It's not an end all because you're, again, when you're looking for good people, you are gonna to wanna to interview them and see how their culture index matches the, the role. So we use it as a tool. Ne we never use it to say, oh no, this person is not a fit. We just wanna know what you're like and how you would fit in the role. So we, we do that. Maria, what's your thought on that? You, you see more employers using these types of tools? I do, I, I absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes I think it's great because, you know, especially if it's an introvert, extrovert type opportunity, I always say anyone that would want to work with my company, you better be an extrovert, you better be okay with loud music, you better be okay with like practical jokes. We need to know if, if it's gonna match, if the skill is not going to match, if the personality is not gonna match, it is probably not a good idea to bring that candidate in or you know, to spend as much time with that candidate. So you know, I do agree with that. I think that you know, your personality is your personality and it's okay. You don't have to be an extrovert. It's just who are you and is it gonna work best? Because they want you to do well. It costs a lot of money when someone work, starts working with a company and then decides three months later it's not a good fit or maybe you decide as the employer it's not a good fit. And so that's something that's, uh, that I agree with. And you know, Keith, one of the things that, that speaks to is that you know, a lot of employers are looking to fill a spot as opposed to hiring that great fit for a long-term hire. And maybe you could just expand upon that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that has a lot to do also with how well a resume is created. Um, resumes, I always say every single person looking for a job has a resume but not everybody knows how to properly build and create their resume. And there are resume writing services out there. They're absolutely worth their weight in gold. Uh, but getting back to the question, uh, if, if they're looking to just put a warm body in a chair, it's probably not the best match, you know, because they're, they're just looking for someone that can maybe do some of the job. If your resume really speaks to the role though, you're gonna stand out to a hiring manager or somebody in HR that's gonna say, you know, this is more than just a warm body. This is somebody that will be able to elevate the department. This is somebody that can add incredible value to our service or a product or whatever it may be. But they're only gonna know that based on how you customize your resume to match the job that they're looking for. And I'll also add, I am a huge proponent for cover letters. I know it's a, it, it, it's a love-hate relationship with employers and with candidates. I think a cover letter is a fantastic way. It's a one-page brag sheet where you get to just tell them exactly who you are, how you can help their company or business, and what you bring to the table. I think if you do those things, you really change the game enough to make yourself not just a warm body in a seat, but a solid quality hire. Diane, a cover letter. You seem to get a, a quite the reaction to that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I did because I I think they're they're good and bad. I think if you if you do a cover letter, don't use AI. Of course. It, it, <laughs> if you do a cover letter, make to your point, make it something that makes me say I want to turn the page to the resume. If it's going to be the same old blah blah blah, I'm not going to read it. So forget it. Don't waste your time. But to your point, if it's something that's it, it's short, it's sweet, and it gives me something that says, I want more, and I want to turn that page, then yes, absolutely. Maria, I'm going to ask you this question. We'll start okay. with you. Thank God you didn't ask me the uh, cover letter question. <laughs> Steve, would you like to talk about that? Sure, why not? Okay, so I am not a fan at all um, because I believe in networking my way into every opportunity. So networking for me means that if for my cover letter is usually through LinkedIn, and it's Hey, John, it was so great speaking with you. Thank you so much for the 15 minutes you spent with me today. I really appreciate it. As for your request, please see my resume attached. I look forward to next steps, and I thank you once again. Kind regards, Maria. That's my cover letter. I'm sorry. I, Sorry, guys. But seriously, for me, everything is work fast. Why? Opportunities come and go very, very quickly. So I really am a fan of networking my way in. I have seen some really beautiful cover letters also. You know, if someone recommends you something like that, okay, great. 
But the truth be told is, and I know that you guys can speak to this also, we go through a lot of candidates. And sometimes we just don't have the time, exactly. And so that could be, if you're banking on that cover letter being your be all end all, you're in trouble. You may be in trouble. I'm not gonna say you are in trouble, but you may be in trouble, so. By the way, speaking of networking, uh, as when I was uh, president for a while of our industrial association, and I was on the board of directors, and what I would tell people when they go to the meeting, because we would bring uh, new members on board, they'd say, what am I going to get out of it? And I would say, look, when you come to the luncheons, don't be bashful. If you've got something that you think a lot of people could use, when, question, when people say, do you have any questions, you raise your hand. You get noticed. You, tell, you, you don't ask, you don't wait to be asked, what's your name? You say, hi, I'm John Rebecca. It's so interesting about that point that you brought up. What do you think about this? So take the opportunity to answer a question. I'm also going to say that that's great experience for everybody here. So when we get to the Q&A part of this event, that don't be bashful. You have questions here. You have them. Or you wouldn't have come here. Ask the question that's important to you. What do you want to take away from this event tonight? With a response, an answer to something that you've got an itch you want to scratch. Come up with those questions while you're sitting here. So when I say, we're going to open up the Q&A, does anybody have any questions? I want to see a lot of hands up. Because people will remember you. And I never forget going to some luncheons where I would get up and, and say that and ask a question. And people could come up afterwards. I'm so happy you asked that question, because that's exactly what I was going to ask. And I would think, well, why didn't you ask it? But that's how you get noticed. And that's how you get experience in responding and having that conversation that Maria talked about in her presentation, the importance of having that conversation. So that's just a little bit of advice, but I want to get on to one more question, because I think you're going to want to hear this. Uh, and Diane, I'll start with you again. What are job candidates' top two or three mistakes they make during the interview process? Mm -hmm. So I think this goes back to my first point. So be prepared. That is, people make the mistake they are not prepared. They're not prepared for the job they actually applied for. They're not prepared uh, for the company. With you know, with, as I mentioned before, research the company. And they're not prepared with what their resume says. So if I'm going to look at your resume, I'm going to ask you questions based on your resume. And you know, sometimes you get deer in the headlights. So, so those are I think the top mistakes that I've seen over the years. Be prepared. Show me that you want to be part of the company. Keith? Yeah, I would say the same. Be prepared. Um, come with questions in mind. As thorough as an interview may be, you're undoubtedly going to leave with some type of question. Ask that question. Let, them, let the interviewer know that you're actually curious or interested. Oh, you make X. How do you go about doing that? Or who's your target market? Maybe it's not exactly the most exciting question, but if it's a question that you have, ask it. Let them know that you're thinking about what's going on in this interview. Because interviews like dating, you know, you're you're interviewing them, they're interviewing you. You, you want to make sure it's a good fit. You just you don't want to take a job just for the sake of saying, I have a job. It's gotta be the right job, it's gonna be a job that fits, and you're only gonna get there by making sure it's compatible on both ends. Maria? So if it's a face-to-face -face interview, I have a problem with the wet noodle handshake. That is <laughs> definitely not uh, something that I, I actually, it turns me off immediately. I'm like, seriously, come on, shake my hand. Shake my hand, go ahead, don't be afraid. I have plenty of hand sanitizer, but that is one thing. Um, and the other thing also is, I really believe in doing my due diligence on whomever it is I'm going to speak with. So if you do have the ability to find out who they are, check them out, look at their profiles if you can on LinkedIn, or look to see if they're, just Google them and see what pops up. Were they in any media? Were they interviewed recently? Anything like that is great information because you know what? It's gonna give you insight into who that person is, what type of personality they are. Maybe there is something that connects you. Maybe there's something that you're both interested in. Very, very quickly, I had someone years ago who loved music and he was in IT. And I told him, I was like, why are you not putting all this volunteer music stuff at the bottom of your resume? He said to me, he's like, well, I don't think it's really applicable. And I was like, are you kidding? And I said, go on LinkedIn, join some musical groups as well. Two weeks later, 
interview one, second week after that, interview two, got hired by a company. They said, by no stretch of the imagination were you the strongest candidate. But the reason we chose you was because of the commonality and your love for music. His name was George. I will never forget him. And because of that, I really believe in, you know, do your homework. Get to know who it is that you're speaking with. Um, one, one more thing about resumes. Um, there, there's two words that come to mind. Honesty and integrity. Don't lie. Okay? Do not lie. Um, since we're all New Yorkers, we all know about the famous George Santos, who, who to get elected to Congress, lied. It's, I, I get it, people say, well, I just wanted to embellish. Do not lie. I had a dear friend who, uh, right after 9-11, um, was, was attempting, because a lot, a lot of executives got displaced, the business had gone down, especially in certain markets she was involved with. And I said, well, I said, what are you saying about resumes? She goes, I cannot believe how many people claim to have military service because they know that that gives them a leg up and you come to find out they never served. So there are a lot of things that you never want to put on a resume. And if you, don't, if you haven't done it, don't put it down. So please, honesty and integrity, because we all know the story of the infamous and you don't want to be that person that everybody remembers. So please remember that. Now, I mentioned that I'm going to open the floor up to the floor for it's Q&A time. And, and I really want to start moving this along so we get all the questions in. So please, raise your hand. We want to get somebody to come around. We have a, a question from Zoom. Oh, OK. Yes. My question is, being a fresh graduate with required skills in the field I wanted to work in, but still there are requirements that say experience. Resume is quite efficient with good grades and skills, but lacks a company to pick his experience. I'm, I'm assuming a fresh graduate, skills that are in the, are required for a job, but they don't have experience. How do you get this person who is freshly graduated to the top of a list, get, a re, get their resume to the top of a list? Okay. Keith, you want to start with that one? Um, yeah, that's a, it's, that's always going to be tough. Um, what I would say is um, whatever volunteer work, whatever you've done that leads towards that particular job, I would put that down. I would also have a section where you translate what you've learned in school, what you've done to accomplish that skill, and how that can then in turn make you a good employee at the company that you're applying for. Diane? Yeah. Yeah, I would say project work too, right? So you've all done projects in school. Put that down and show how what you did, whatever the pro a lot of these projects are pretty deep. Put, put it down and show how it relates to the job you're applying for. That can give you at least something that employers can look at. Uh, I'm a very big fan of LinkedIn, as you can tell, probably. <laughs> so one of the things that I have all of my recent grads or soon-to-be grads do is after they create a nice really robust LinkedIn profile. I have them join groups specific to the industry that they want to find employment in. And I basically have them post, hi, my name is Maria. I'll be graduating from NYIT with a degree in digital marketing in 2024. I'm so excited to be a part of this group. And I would just like to put it out there that I'm looking for an opportunity. What would your advice be to someone just starting out? Thank you so much in advance. Kind regards, Maria. That's it. I cannot tell you how many of my recent grads got jobs because of the groups on LinkedIn. And you're allowed to join 100, by the way. And no, I am not a spokesperson for LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, OK, we're going to open up to the audience. Questions? Ah, yes. Uh, hello, I have a question. Um, when you are applying. Could you please uh, just uh, tell us what your name is? Ah, tell us your name. And, and please speak up. Go ahead. My name is Melissa. I'm a last year student in marketing and communication. Uh, when you are in an interview, sometimes they ask you your qualities and your flow. We have some of them that we don't want to hear because you hear them uh, too often or something. So I love that question and I ask that question because I, I want to know, know your strengths, right? So your qualities. Tell me all the good stuff about you. And when you tell me, be confident about it because I love that. But when they ask for your flaws, tell them. 
because that shows me that you are knowledgeable about yourself. If you say, well, I don't really, I don't know, I don't really have anything. And I'm thinking, they don't have anything? <laughs> you know, so don't be afraid to say those things. I, I am always much more satisfied that someone told me something they're looking to work on about themselves, self-awareness, than sitting there going, oh, I don't know, I never thought of that. So don't be afraid of that and be confident. Keith? Yeah, totally agree with the confidence. Uh, your, your strengths, you should be robust in your answer. Uh, for as far as the flaws, that's always a tough one to answer. Uh, you never really are comfortable saying, well, I'm not good at this. But, but I like the advice of something that you're going to, or you want to invest in yourself, something you want to build to make yourself better. So in a way, it's like saying, I'm not strong here, but I'm working to get better at it. I, I personally like that response. Any thoughts, Maria? I agree with that, and I want you to remember that there's no such thing as a perfect candidate. I think everyone on this uh, panel here will attest to that. There's no such thing as a perfect candidate. It is okay to say, you know, for me, I am super competitive, but I work on myself every single day. I take, try to take a step back. So whatever it is, just make sure, as my fellow panelists here said, you know, make sure that you have a solution. You're working on it. You know, I'm not as strong at this, but I'm working on it. I'm taking a class. I'm taking a course. I'm working with a mentor, something like that. But don't worry about being perfect. No one is perfect. No one. Questions? Oh, wow. Yes. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. I wonder if someone. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yes, yeah. of course, the sad presentation. <laughs> yeah. I'm here ago, one of the students of Madame Broche here. And, as, uh, and one of my French colleague students who talked to you some minutes ago. And I am from uh, Ecart Paris, Art Dealing. And I just came here for one semester and, and maybe later for the PC. My question is if someone uses a kind of uh, intelligence artificial hack in a certain way to gain an appointment with one of you, what would be your reaction to bypass the IA scanner? For example, there is this, there is some firms to bypass this scanner. And one of my friends uses it. It went well for him, but I want to know if you notice this, what would be your reaction? Uh, so, so you're saying is that a resume got past the screening process? Yes. It was it was not a lie the resume. It was an honest resume, but there was a hidden prompt in the resume. And through the, the scan of the IA, ah, it was accepted, saying this candidate seems to be a very confident and suitable for uh, the job. And he, he went to, uh, the, to the interview, and the interview went well, and he was hired. But ah. I wouldn't know, because of this actor become more and more known but in certain circles, what would be your reaction if you are hacked? Like this. Maria? Okay, my, my, my French, French friend. friend. I will tell you. <laughs> it's so funny that you said that. Years ago, when we used to write resumes, we would actually, at the very bottom of the resume, we would take the entire job description, narrow it down to like a negative size one font, and turn it white. So the ATS system would pick it up, and all the keywords and everything that they were looking for, everything was fantastic. Today, the ATS systems are a lot smarter than they were you know, when I used to recruit, which was quite a while ago. Some of them, it'll still go through. But listen, at the end of the day, if it's done in, a, in an ethical way where I can still see that you're a qualified candidate, I'm totally cool with that because look at what I do on LinkedIn. All day long, I'm reaching out to people, I'm getting in front of people, I'm asking questions. So as long as it's ethical to me and they still have the skill sets necessary for the job, Go ahead, do it. Interesting. Questions, we have more questions out here. I want to make sure we get as many people as possible. Yes, the gentleman right there, yes. Hi, uh, Maria, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It was a great presentation, I loved it. Uh, and to both the panel, uh, all the panelists. I have two questions, so bear with me, please. Uh, first question. Your name is what? I'm oh, sorry, sorry Rasik Sharma. Ah, thank you. Uh, so my first question is regarding uh, the resume creation and keyword matching. You discussed about job scan and things like that. And you did mention about ATS developing or AI and things like that, right? 
So uh, my question is, what is the minimum match when you're looking at a uh, job responsibility and the resume? Uh, the 50% 50, 50 match, 60 to 70% match. Uh, what is the minimum criteria we should look at when we are applying and we're taking help of uh, keyword match? That's my first question. Keith, you experience that at all? Um, as a recruiter, I'm generally reaching out versus just receiving blind resumes. So uh, I don't think that exactly uh, pertains to me as much. But I will say, if, like Maria said earlier, if there's no perfect candidate. So if I'm looking, if I have my job description for my clients and I'm looking at resumes all day long, I'm looking for a close match. I'm looking for, I, I'm, I'm, my goal is maybe 75%. My goal is 100%, but that doesn't exist. 75% uh, I think is, is pretty reasonable. If it is a very tough job, a very, very specific job that is almost like a unicorn, 50%, because then it's my job to convince my client why this candidate doesn't have everything they want, but why they have the important things they need for them to be successful. Yeah, uh, according to recent articles, it's generally 80%. You want to create that 75 to 80% match. So, um, and a lot, uh, look, what, I'm not telling you anything you can't just look up, right? So you could look up on any of these programs that will review your resume and match it to jobs, and generally they're looking for, to get your resume to at least that 80% point. So you'll, you'll make it through in terms of the review. Last question from Zoom. What are your thoughts on video recording interviews, meaning when an employer has you record yourself and then send it to them later to watch? Oh, interesting. Maria? I just huffed and he heard me. <laughs> so I am not a fan, and I think that, you know what, you're going to spend the same amount of time recording yourself as you probably would speaking to a human being. So for me, I personally, I understand why some companies do it. I really do. But at the same time, when you're speaking to a human being, your expression is very, very different. Your, the way that you're picking up on nuances and just how the person is looking at you, like if they're questioning something, of course, you're going to expound on that and try and satisfy their query. But I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. I really do believe in the you know, human and the interaction. They're going to spend the same amount of time listening to you anyway. So shorten the interview by a few minutes and just have an interview. John, do we have time for a couple more questions? Oh, one more question. One more. OK, we have the, well, I, I, sorry back there, but uh, we have our, our esteemed guest here tonight, Dr. Deborah Cohen. Go ahead, Doc. Hi, I'm Deborah Cohen, and I'm the Deacon School of Management and the executive producer of the In Reality podcast. And my question is, if, if you're talking so much about skills and skill base, would it make more sense to arrange your resume based on I have this skill, and this is how I acquired it, this skill, and this is how I acquired it, rather than to organize it based on I had this job, and these are the skills I learned at this job, and these are the skills I got from those experiences. And how would you feel about getting a resume that looked that way? Diane, you want to start well, with that? Yeah, I was going to say, so that changes the dynamic, right? Because we're never used to seeing a resume written that way. But I like it. So I would think that if I, if I received one that way, I would say, hmm, you know, again, make me sit up and take notice of you because you're doing something that's not in the normal. And now, as long as I can, you know, the flow works, I like it. I, I, I would have no problem looking at a resume like that. And, you know, as long as it, it, it shows me everything I want, I think it shows professional creativity, like I talked about earlier. So I'm open to that. Keith? You know, that's a, a really, really good question because the industry is very rooted and I would say doesn't always like a lot of change. Like years ago, it was popular to put your, your picture on a resume and that, that had a very short shelf life. Um, I, I would fear that you're more resistant to change. Hiring managers would see a format they didn't like or weren't comfortable or used to and just go right past it. And I think that would be a tragedy for a qualified candidate to be dismissed because 
somebody just didn't like the format or, or the photo or whatever, you know, it might be. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm, I'm getting the signal because we have our online audience. Uh, we, we're gonna have plenty of time for networking and we can, we can all ask questions after the event. But for those of, those of uh, our friends online, I cannot thank you enough um, for tuning in, listening in. We believe this to be a very, very important topic for all of you. Um, thank you, thank you for being such an engaging audience here tonight. And thank you to our panelists and our speaker, Keith, Diane, Maria, thank you so much for joining us this evening. They deserve a round of applause. And thank you, John. One last thing, we, please fill out your survey forms, become a follower and a listener to our podcast series, and I thank you all very, very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.